Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kia Simone. And listen, we got to get into this week's episode of Love and Marriage Huntsville. But before we do, uh, first of all, y'all was reading me in the comments last week by Kia. Uh, you over here trying to read Tisha by Ando O V S O V A, and we say O V where we from. I said, all right, hold on. You ain't got to read me like that. I see everybody got their own little mob. All y'all pop out when y'all ready. Y'all ain't going to be jumping me all kind of ways. And secondly, I got my lima beans and my turkey wings on. So we got to hurry up and get through this. So let's get into it. Now, before we do, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. Of course, I got to shout out my super thanks. Thank you so much to Courtney McNeil, Amber, Lede, Yvette Greer, Lakeisha Toussaint, Alessia Dismute. So this week's episode picks up in the middle of Mel and her strong woman speech about how you scared to let Tisha get around this strong woman right here because she probably going to leave your ass. Marcel said, this got to be a damn joke. She said, this is not a joke. No, it's not a joke or a drill. She dead serious. Marcel said, that's not true. I've always wanted you and Tisha to be in a good place. Mel said, but that's not what your actions show. She said, it's not just this one thing. He said, well, please tell me what else it is. So she finally gives the example of, well, when we have social media wars, it's not necessarily me and Tisha going back and forth. It's me and you. He said, you mean like back in 2019? And she's insisting that it's not 2019, it's 2020. Well, either way, it, it's 2023 now. So why is y'all talking about this now? Mel said, you always throwing jabs. He said, well, my problem is I can't have or express my opinion without it being called a jab. She said, well, I just need you to own that you be throwing jabs. So is that the whole reason we, we here? Is the whole reason we're here is you want him to say, I be throwing jabs like Marcel said I don't have a problem acknowledging that I throw jabs as a matter of fact I want credit for my jabs Marcel said but as far as I'm concerned a t-shirt business is a trinket it's my idea of a small business that ain't really doing nothing Mel said see that's the jab I'm talking about who, who's the small business that ain't really doing nothing he said anybody that applies to including you Mel said well who was on your panel that just sells t-shirts he said, well, I sell t-shirts. Tisha sells t-shirts. Mel said, well, did y'all get paid from y'all's expo? Did y'all cut y'all selves a check? Marcel said, what's the relevance of that question? Mel said, the relevance of the question is, I was good enough to be on y'all's panel when y'all weren't considering paying people. But then when we got to the point of talking about having to pay people, all of a sudden I didn't have enough relevant business expertise. I said, now that's a good damn point. Mel said, you felt like I didn't have enough knowledge even though I started a business that made a million dollars in a year. Marisol said, yeah, and it went bankrupt. Mel said, hold on, hold on now. Let's, let's be real clear. I filed because I went through a divorce. You have also been bankrupt and filed. Marcel said, yeah, everybody at this table has filed bankruptcy. Mel said, yeah, but I filed bankruptcy after my ex filed bankruptcy because he wasn't going to leave all that on me. You filed bankruptcy because your finances weren't in order. Um, I may, could be me. Are are those not two, two different ways of saying the same thing? Because don't lots of people go through divorces that do not file bankruptcy? Marcel said, I respect it. I respect your opinion and your right to your opinion, just like I have a right to my opinion. My question, though, is do we have to agree? Do we have to share an opinion in order for us to move forward? Mel said, I'm not saying I need you to agree with me. I just need you to be factual when you talk about me. We both know that I was in business for over 10 years. Mel said, you're trying to limit me to e-commerce. Marcel said, no, I just don't know what you do. I know you ain't just call this lady Tommy. Marcel said, I don't know all of what you do. Mel said, I just got into e-commerce. He said, well, I don't know that. She said, yes, you do, because you've known me since 2014. And at the point that y'all met us, I had been a full-time entrepreneur for five years, which is why you tried to go into business with me and my ex-husband. He said, well, let me ask you a very specific question. What do you do now that you did in 2014? Well, she said property preservation, the same thing I put you in. He said, oh, I didn't know that. She said, yes, you did because you made comments on social media about my class. Marcel told this lady to calm down in Spanish only to read her to her face in English. This man said, listen, all I'm saying is every time I hear about you and business in the same sentence, it's a new business. And what it's starting to look like to me is somebody who's just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. I, well, just, okay. Marcel said, and the reason I feel like you're able to sell products is because you have a platform and you've used your business acumen and this platform 
platform to sell your products. He said the unfortunate part is when we're talking to these people in this audience, they need help and they don't have platforms. So you can say, yeah, you do this and this and this, but they don't have step one, which is have a platform of being on the number one reality show on OWN. Sometimes um, Marcel be right. And, and I know I don't like him most of the time, but he's right. Marcel, so now while I do not value product-based businesses for people who don't have platforms, that doesn't mean that I don't value you for who you are. Okay, Marcel, so... In other words, your business ain't shit, but I love you though. Now in true Marceau fashion, he made it somebody else's fault. He said, in my opinion, what the Fletchers did was they took one comment I made and they embellished on it. It was one statement I made and it's been made to be a whole conversation. Now you, you know. Use a damn lie. You sat at that damn dinner table with the Fletchers and dragged them people from here to the Better Business Bureau. Marceau said it was a much bigger conversation. Mel said, yeah, that's all well and good. I understand all that. But my issue is for you to sit here and try to downplay my business expertise, knowledge, and acumen is literally a disgrace. Mel said, all I'm saying is don't keep coming for me and what I'm doing. Just don't do that. This was the most unnecessary nonsense call. I just wanted to be in your face conversation I have ever seen. Mar so say, okay, I won't. I will say that I do value you in terms of marketing. And I didn't know you were still in property preservation because that is a business that I do value. And Mel sits up, she's smiling. And oh, is, is this, is this what you wanted? Is, is this, why we're here, you wanted Marceau's approval. Marceau said, just because I have an opinion, it does not mean I'm taking a jab. Mel said, hey, as long as we're clear about that, that just because one of us has an opinion going forward from this day, henceforth, now and forevermore, it does not mean that we are taking a jab. And we needed to have this whole damn powwow to come to that conclusion. Marceau said, well, now that we're in a better place, yeah, Kimmy and Maurice are gonna host a town hall to get everybody's feet feedback on the expo. Mel said, Kimmy and Maurice want to get everybody's feedback. He said, well, what they're going to do is they're going to host it on our behalf because we feel like we're probably going to be too defensive because we feel attacked when people are coming at us about it. Marceau said, I do value you guys' feedback. So, you know, I'll just let you know about it. Mel said in the confessional, you know, it's funny that this meeting started out because of Marceau criticizing my business but it's ending with him asking for my opinion on this event. That's, that's a good damn point. Because how in the hell is it that me and my business ain't good enough to come up on your palette of a stage, but you want me to give you all of my feedback and observations and how you can help grow and improve your business if you don't grow and improve the hell. So then we move on to Tiffany, Lewis, and their baby. They're going to the park to have a picnic or a complaint session or some shit. I don't know. But in true Tiffany fashion, she got on my damn nerves. So they get to the park. Lewis starts laying the blankets out on the ground and she said, yeah, since daddy's never home, daddy can set up the picnic. Girl, sit down. She said, yeah, everybody's always asking, where's Lou? Where's Lou? And I'm always saying, lose that baseball, lose that baseball. She said, are you going to make more time to be at home? He said, yeah, I mean, of course I'll make more time to be at home, but you also know that I go from one season to the next. In the confessional, Lewis said he was offered the opportunity to join Alabama A&M's baseball team as an assistant coach and a pitching coach. He said that's his alma mater and that's his dream sport. So, I mean, it was a no-brainer for him. Tiffany said, so is that why you said, yes, we can have a baby because you knew you weren't going to be at home anyways? And that was the beginning of her pissing me off. Lewis said, oh, oh goodness, this is what we're doing, huh? She said, yeah, I mean, whatever it takes to get some quality time. Girl, this man asked you for quality time last year. The man asked you on a TV show for quality time. And you said, well, I can't give you quality time, but I can give you a baby. Tiffany said, I mean, I know we said that Ace wasn't going to slow me down. But in reality, I mean, he slows everything down. Well, that tells us you weren't operating in reality. Welcome. Tiffany said, you know, sometimes you sit in his rocking chair and I just cry for no reason because, you know, I feel like I'm trying to be everything to everyone. Lewis said, well, why do you feel that way? She said, I mean, because there's always something to do. I mean, there's laundry and I'm worried about groceries and I'm worried about the kids and transportation. Lewis said, yeah, but babe, that, that's, and he just started shaking his head just like never fucking mind because what did you expect? This was the life you already had and you amplified it by adding a newborn. All your husband asked you for was to touch him. Please touch 
watch me sometimes and act like you like me. That's all I need to be satisfied. And you say, I can't do none of that. I cannot do none of that. But what I can do is I can bring a whole nother human into the world and hope that this baby can hold together a relationship that our big grown asses couldn't hold together. She said, you know, even after a day full of doing all of the things, I still feel like I've done nothing. I feel less than. Lewis is just looking around like this is some absolute bullshit. I'm sorry, I'm gonna piss some people off and it is what it is because I don't feel bad for her. I'm so very sorry because she did this intentionally and you did this to be able to be this victim you're being. She said, I mean, I look in the mirror and I think I've gained all this weight. He said, you look amazing. She said, and then the doctor tells you you can't even work out for eight weeks. I mean, I knew going into this that postpartum depression was a possibility. I just didn't think it would happen to me. So, so are you saying that you thought that planning this pregnancy with a motive of manipulation was going to eliminate the possibility of postpartum depression? Is, is that how you thought the math worked? Tiffany said, you know, I'm just glad that you actually took an opportunity to be here with us. Lewis said, why, why would I not? Because you make the man sound like a damn deadbeat. She said, I mean, you say that like it's easy, but you don't actually do it. He said, I mean, when we have time, then we spend time. He said, it's just like when you were building and running a business. She was crazy for a minute and I was taking care of everything at the house. Tiffany says in the confessional, I had a fantasy of what it would look like for Lewis and I to have a baby together. What I did not imagine is having a husband that's absent. So that leaves Tiffany really depleted. I don't know what kind of prenup y'all got if y'all got one at all, but it couldn't take all this to get whatever check you're trying to get. This is some bullshit. Tiffany told Lewis, I really thought our life was gonna be the same way after Ace that it was before Ace, but as soon as he came, you were gone. She said, you know, I never even realized how much I appreciated you in the small things, you know, like the dishes needing to come out of the dishwasher, the laundry needing to come out of the dryer, the dog needing to go out in the morning. And you know, the doctor says I can't lift anything heavier than the baby. Lewis is just sitting there looking at the ground disassociating from this shit. And I don't feel bad for his ass either. This is what he gets for going along with her bullshit rather than saying, no, I didn't tell you I want to bring a whole nother person into the world. I just want you to touch me at night sometimes. Lewis said, well, listen, first of all, we knew whether I got into coaching or not that us having a baby was going to change our lives, period. He said, you know, you're not less of a person. You know, you're not less of a mom. Your body is what it is. Like you are putting this pressure on yourself. She said, I mean, you say these things like I'm supposed to know. I mean, I don't know. I didn't know. He said, we knew that life would be different. And this isn't even weaponized incompetence or weaponized ignorance. This is flat out lying because she herself said she knew they didn't have time for a baby. But for some reason, that was what she thought was going to fix their marriage. Lewis said, I mean, I tried to stay off the road for those first few weeks, but I mean, I told you that once I knew that home was good and everything was okay, it was going to be hit the road, Jack. Lewis said, there is no preparation for having a whole newborn child in your life. There's just not. He said, even when we were younger, it changed our lives. She said, yeah, I mean, but I guess I just expected something different because, you know, when I was younger, I just remember good times. I don't remember feeling this way. The way this lady lies drives me up a damn wall. She sat up and told us she couldn't stand the first baby daddy. Didn't she cheat on the baby daddy first husband or some bullshit to be with the second? I, I, I don't know. Lewis said, the thing is you're more mature now. She said, you know, I don't know. I feel like I have something to lose. He said, yeah, because you waited 15 years to have a baby. So you're living a life that's far more calculated than the life you were living when you had a baby back then. Tiffany said, no, I really think it's that I feel like I have something to lose and I don't want to lose you. You know, I really think about how happy you are. Lewis said, happy with what? She said, with us. He said, what, what? He said, how would you lose me if we're happy? She said, because you're not home, babe. I mean, how do I know that? You know what Tiffany's issue is? Tiffany literally thinks she's smarter than everybody else. And she gives me that her emotions do not operate. She comes across like she's emotionally unalive, like she's just not there. And everything she does, she does from a calculated, manipulative mind state. She said, you know, I always think about when you're on the road, are you gonna see some hot young thing and wanna leave me? 
Is that why you had a baby? Because you think he might be enticed by something outside of the home since you were not willing to touch him inside of the home and you weren't going to save your marriage by touching your husband, but you would save your marriage by having a baby. Is, is that what happened? She said, I just wonder, you know, is he going to come home and love me the same way? Is he going to love Ace the same way? You know, I know that you weren't really on board with having a baby initially. And then you came around and said, yes, of course, let's do it. So, you know, I don't know. Lula said, well, the thing you have to understand is that I'm going to always be true to who I am. And there's going to be temptation everywhere in anything that we do. But you have to trust that I know where home is and I know that I have a damn good home. Lewis said, I'm on the road because of my family. I'm on the road because I'm trying to continue working toward putting us in a different position. She said, yeah, but I mean, you know how you said you felt about your dad not being around. Do you want Ace? to grow up feeling how you felt. Now, you know how I know God ain't through with me yet? Because all I could think about is how I was gonna tell her about her crooked ass mama. That's like, girl, what? I don't play that plan with people's trauma in their face. Like, I, I, I don't play that shit. What you trying to do is trigger his trauma. And you're trying to make him feel like he's going to inflict onto his child what his father inflicted onto him and thereby cause him to give up his entire life to come sit up under your sorry. Tiffany has such a manipulative personality and I cannot stand it. Like if conniving were a person, it would be her. Lewis said, my dad not being around has nothing to do with our situation with Ace. Lewis said, when I'm present, I'm present. When I'm at home, do I not take care of him? This she said, well, I, I just want to remind you of what you've shared. And when you are sitting around trying to figure out why he don't share shit else with you, you let this be your reminder. Lewis said, you know what? Let's be full real. I don't remember my daddy not being there when I was a baby. When I tell you about my father not being there for me, I'm talking about 10, 12, grown. We got 15 and 16 year olds. That's like saying I'm not there for them. He said, they know when they need me, I'm right there. She said, what about when I need you? You know, when you need me, I'm right there. Like girl, go find a hobby. She said, I'm just saying I need you. He says, so what you want me to do? Stop working? He said, what do you need? She said, I mean, I just want to feel your touch. I want quality time. What in the twilight zone, the truth ain't in you hell is going on here because you got here from your husband asking you to touch him. And the only way you were willing to let this man touch you is if it were for the sake of impregnation. Now that he has impregnated you and y'all have had this baby and the baby done turned your life upside down like we knew it was gonna do. Now you're longing for his touch. Girl, touch hell. He said, so would you say that you want more of it because it's not that you're not getting it? Yes, I want more. He said, yeah, because wanting more and not getting it are two different things. He said, okay, well, I'll do a better job of making sure that you get that. And I said, well, good luck to you because as soon as she gets that, she gonna move the goalpost, but that's your damn fault for putting up with that and moving on. So we move on to everybody getting together for this town hall meeting. Maurice is the first person to get there. Now, I don't know what in the Papa Smurf got a job he is wearing, but let's just get into it. Everybody greeted everybody upon arriving except Stormy. Stormy refused to greet Marcel. Marcel said in the confessional with all due sarcasm, he was absolutely heartbroken. So they're all sitting around the table and they trying to figure out who are they still waiting on. They said, well, Mel is coming. Marcel said, well, yeah, you know, I met up and had lunch with Mel yesterday. Tisha looked like, oh, really? Maurice said, well, what was y'all meeting up about? He said, well, basically she was getting a lot of feedback about my opinions and my point to her was pretty simple that in terms of the ex I wanted businesses that were actually relevant to our crowd and our community. Now, as he's saying this, Martel is looking across the table like he trying to figure the exact point at which he gonna whoop your ass. Marceau said, I also let her know that the reason she's able to sell her products is because of this platform that she's on. And had she been selling those shirts before this platform, people wouldn't be buying them like that. He said, now that's different from someone like Stormy who was selling products before this platform, that's where Martel drew the line. He couldn't take that bullshit no more. Martel said, hold on, hold on. Let, let me let me make sure I understand exactly what you're saying before I hop, skip, and jump on your ass. So are you saying that if we weren't doing something before coming on this platform, we shouldn't be doing it after we get on this platform or whatever we're doing once we get on this platform is not relevant. Marcel said, yeah, I mean, it's not that simple, but pretty much. Now in the middle of all this, Kimmy comes walking in. Martel is not moved. Hey, hey, good to see you. So, so listen, uh, by your measure, 
a lot of the stuff that you're doing would be considered irrelevant then, right? Marcel, so yeah, that, that's correct. One thing Marcel does not mind doing is cutting off his nose despite his face. If you think you're going to get him to defend himself in an effort to show him that he was wrong for coming at you, never, never, never. He will fall on his own sword first. Kimmy said, when I came in, there was major tension in the room. So clearly we need to get this thing back on track already. She's asking, so what were y'all saying? Girl, just sit back and let them throw their mud. So Marcel goes to catch Kimmy up and he said, basically I had a conversation with Mel. And what it boils down to is I was saying that I felt like we should only have relevant businesses at the Black Expo. Martel once again cannot take this bullshit. Marcel said, just, just hold on. Let me finish telling the lady what actually happened. He said, I don't give a damn what actually happened because the truth of the matter is any business is relevant. Martel said, use, for example, me cutting grass. He said, let's go all the way back to my very beginning where I was cutting grass and I started with one yard. He said, and I built that business one yard at a time. And for me, making $120,000 was a lot of money. And he makes a good point. That is absolutely relevant experience and a person who's able to give relevant advice to people who are seeking to start a business. Just because you feel like them cutting grass or them selling t-shirts or is not a viable business or it's not a business that you respect or it's not something you would do that don't mean that what you just said is true. Just because you said it don't make it true. If somebody is going to make a hundred thousand or a million dollars or whatever number of dollars they going to make cutting yards or selling t-shirts, they, they are no less the hundred thousand there or the millionaire because you don't respect it. So the last person to arrive is Mel and she comes in draped in this caftan of a dress. Hey y'all, hey, how y'all doing? Girl, it's messy in here, just sit down. So Kimmy is trying to explain to Marceau like a five-year-old that words matter. She said, you know, you can't just go around telling people that their business is not relevant. That's offensive. Marceau said, listen, Tisha already told me it's wrong. I apologize, that should be the end of the story. He said, did he apologize? Mel is in the confessional saying, listen, that I don't know what I walked into. I came in here on Zen and they on 10. I don't know what's going on. So Mel speaks up and she says, well, listen, yes, Marceau and I did have a conversation yesterday and he did actually apologize. Tisha looked at Marceau like, oh yeah? She said it took a while to get there, but he said it, right, Marcel? He said, yeah, that's, that's correct. Mel said, well, since we're here to give feedback, I'd like to first start by giving you your kudos. I told both of you, I thought this was a great first run. I do think it would have been amazing to have, you know, different subgroup settings where you could have people who do hair and makeup and photography. So as Mel is suggesting these subgroup sessions, Tiffany is saying, yeah, that would create the opportunity for you to get to know your audience better. Tisha said they had actually discussed that. That's something that they wanted to do, but after the feedback that they were getting from the meetings that they were having, they decided to do away with the breakout sessions, but they do want to look into having that in future expos. So Stormy starts explaining that she's coming from more of a motivational place and felt like they should have had more motivational speakers. She said, because as she looked out at the entrepreneurs in that space, they all look like they're ready to know how to go. And when you're in that position, the mindset is key more so than any information you can give them because a lot of them don't have the funds to go out and get a CPA or an attorney. So doesn't that explain exactly why alternative resources are what they need. They need instruction on what can you do when you do not have the funds to just go get you a CPA or an attorney, or these are grants that are available, or these are ways that you can build your business, or this is a way to start a business when you don't have those funds. That's what would make more sense to me. Marceau said, listen, we could do motivational speeches, but that brings it right back around to where we started. He said, we can tell people you can do it. Just keep going, keep God first. And then they leave with nothing. Listen, let me tell you something. You can do all this, numb your whole rangy kill, knock all the damn sound bowls and all that. But you still need real instruction, real resources, real business practices, real what license do I need? You need real information, not just you got to know you can do it. Stormy said, you know, my journey started off of me believing that I could. Ba baby, uh, the little engine believed it could. It still needed help. Stormy is immediately offended. That ain't even what I said, though. That ain't what I'm talking about. G what? Stormy 
is unnecessarily confrontational. It's like she's always waiting to be offended so that she can fight with somebody. Marso said, and by the way, I'm just referencing the term you used in terms of motivational. I didn't say that that's what you said. Yeah, but you pointed at me. Mel says she thought it would be a good idea to marry the idea. She said, I'm thinking that you have these breakaway sessions, that people get all this contact information for good CPAs and attorneys and things like that. And then you end the whole event with these motivational speeches or these motivational rooms. Marcel said, okay, I, I actually like that idea. Stormy is looking around like, I know you lying. She said, okay, well, Courtney, you want me to tell you my question so you can ask them to him? Stormy said he's being weird. Courtney saying nobody want to know shit. Marcel said, well, you know, I really wanted to hear what Courtney's wife had to say. I this Pickle. Courtney said, well, why you want to know what my wife think? I'm going to tell you what I think. I think you should be quiet and you should let Tisha do the talking. I think... Tisha should be running because with you running, everything is all over the place. So that's what I think. Courtney said, I know for a fact that she's more organized than you. That's one thing I know. Don't make me run down the list. Yeah, you ain't the only one know how to divide and conquer, mother. Go. So Marceau shoots back at Courtney and says, you know, in our business, unlike others, we don't have gender roles. Kimmy said, you know what? Listen, I feel like y'all are getting off track. Y'all going down a rabbit hole and the rabbit hole is not leading to constructive feedback. Marcel said, but I'm accepting all the constructive feedback. I'm just talking in the process. She said, but you're giving a lot of negative comments. Mari said he thinks everybody had their own personal beefs with who they had their beefs with and everybody's expressing that. Kimmy said, no, what I think it boils down to is your damn brother is catty. And his cattiness is rubbing off onto Stormy and Courtney. Marcel said, I really don't give a damn what kind of energy y'all think I'm giving off. The fact of the matter is y'all are giving feedback and I'm receiving the feedback. I'm writing it down while I'm talking my shit. And we're going to be better next year because we're going to implement some of the suggestions that y'all are making. He said, I was an all-A student, so I got this. I know how to figure this out. Kimmy said, so was I. So that don't mean Now Kimmy mad. Tiffany said, so are y'all going to be taking the lead on the expo next year? Kimmy said, they took the lead this year. What What, what are you talking about? Marso said, well, it's, it's going to be the Black Business Expo. I mean, it, it's, it's branded with our name, so... That's what we plan to do now. We all doing something different. That's y'all damn business. But 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 yeah. Mel said, well, hopefully by the time y'all have the next one, it'll be more organized and streamlined so I can actually participate. Tisha said, oh, so you don't feel like it was organized? She said, hell no. I mean, y'all were asking people for money for vendor spaces the day of. We, we talked about this already. Tisha said, so you thought the event itself was not organized? Mel said, hell yeah, absolutely. I thought there were parts that were not well organized. They were not well thought out. But I do think that by the time y'all do it the next go around, it will be. Tisha said everything was planned out and the event was organized and you are in denial. Tisha said now some of the behind the scenes stuff could have been handled better but I mean if we're here to get feedback it's about the main event. I mean we shouldn't be talking about stuff that happened prior. Girl what? Everything that happened prior and the planning and putting together of the event has to do with the event. How, what? Mel said, yes, we are here to discuss that because the prior two leads to the main. We ain't gonna downplay what I just said now. Okay. Mel said in the confessional that when other people had feedback, Tisha was quiet and even receptive. But as soon as she had feedback, all of a sudden Tisha has rebuttal. And she doesn't know what that's about. I, I think part of that in this particular meeting is about she probably just found out that her husband went on some coffee breakfast confrontation date with you. So Mel leaves and Marcel continues explaining that I'm taking in all of y'all's feedback, be it good, bad, or ugly, and I'm going to use it all as a tool for growth. So whether y'all think I'm being negative or just giving negative responses, I am actually taking in everything that y'all are saying. Tiffany said, even the women at the table, Marcel said, listen, I know you're not used to being valued, but you're valued here. I Well, just this man is ruthless. Marcel and Tiffany are apparently going back and forth, and it looks like they edited out most of them going back and forth. And Tiffany says something about Marcel valuing what women have to say. And he responds with something about, well, I'm glad you know who I am. And Stormy is off to the side saying, well, all right, mister, I got to get the last word just like a what the hell? I don't know what it is that helps Tisha to sit through these moments, but my husband wasn't going to be but so many bitches. She's mumbling about, yeah, that's exactly what they do. Martel falling out laughing. Marcel said, yeah, I am a, bitch, a big one. She said, yeah, a bad one. You know, Stormy made comments in the confessional 
about him being sassy. And every time she wants to insult Marceau, she takes digs about him being feminine or being a bitch or being a woman. I don't know if it's a limited range of thought or if it's a limited vocabulary, but there are words established in this language and others to describe men like Marceau, like chauvinist or misogynist or caveman. When Marceau kept saying, yeah, I'm a big bitch, Martel said, throw that at us. Now your ex is the joke. Stormy over there smelling her top. Look like, ooh, I'ma get you a wig. Now, the notable thing to me amongst all this bullshit is Tisha is sitting at this table with peace that surpasses all understanding. Because how are you sitting here not saying a mumbling word while this woman is calling your husband all kind of bitches and hoes? Now, you had feedback from male telling you that your event was disorganized, but you don't have nothing to say about this woman cursing your husband out and calling him out his name like girl so maurice turns to stormy because you know tisha ain't saying nothing and marcel is just trying to roll with the punches and he said why is he a bitch why why are you calling him a bitch stormy said you ask him he's the one who said he's a bitch no you said he's a bitch and he agreed with you marcel said in the confessional that what he realizes about people is that when they are upset at you they will try to use their words to get you as upset as they are at you. He said her calling me a bitch was supposed to make me upset because she's upset, but no, 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 no. I'm gonna return this favor and you won't leave upset, not me. And this is why you gotta be careful who you choose to engage in a war of wits because you got to make sure they got as many fucks invested as you. Now you up here saying all kind of ignorant shit, trying to hurt somebody feelings and they don't give a fuck in the first place. So Marceau looks over the table and he said, is that your feedback, sweetie? Everybody, sweetie, sweetie. I said, I know you lying. Did this lady not just call this man a bitch? And now when he calls her sweetie, oh my God, we just done crossed the damn line. Kimmy said, listen, this is going to go down in the books as unproductive. Marceau said, well, we know who not to invite next time. Courtney said, well, we won't be coming any damn way. Maurice said, well, why wouldn't y'all come? Marceau said, because they ain't needed. Stormy said, ooh, well, that ain't what you told Mel. So you can see Courtney trying to calculate how to back his wife up. He said, listen, we, we don't participate in stuff that ain't organized. Maurice said, well, what was not organized about it? And he said, I mean, the whole thing. Maurice said, but how was the whole thing not organized? Y'all had a whole booth that was set up that was, I, I don't understand. Courtney said, well, I mean, I don't know because I wasn't there. Nick, what? Maurice said, yeah, that, that's kind of my point. You weren't there. So, I mean, how do you know? Stormy said, well, what he do know is that he came up and asked me for $100 after the fact. And you all asked me to be there at no point. And Stormy said, hi, you guys. Hi, Scott people, black people. I would like to be a part of your event. That never happened. Maurice said, so y'all weren't aware the vendors were paying. Is that correct? Stormy said, Kimmy, were you aware that the vendors were paying? Kimmy said, look at now, Maurice. I know you're trying to defend your brother, but hold on back up. Because no, uh, none of us knew that the vendors were expected to pay. Now, Kimmy and Maurice about to argue because he's like, nah, you, you didn't know the vendors were supposed to pay. Kimmy said, no, I didn't know. How did, oh, I'm supposed to know that. Well, Kimmy, I'm so glad to see that you found your voice. Now, the next thing I know, Marcel is saying something about, so basically, if I throw a birthday party and I send out invites, I got to let you know it's not your birthday. Stormy, so what the hell is you talking about by the damn birthday? What? Now, now that's when me and Stormy is on one accord because what in the hell is Marceau talking about? I think this is about the point at which this episode stopped making sense to me. So Stormy and Courtney get up to leave and in the confessional she says that she opted to leave the meeting because if Marceau had kept tap dancing and going where he was going, she doesn't know how able Courtney would have been to remain calm. I, Stormy, Courtney ain't Nino Brown, okay? We ain't scared of Courtney like that. I understand saying your husband love you and he gonna protect you but this whole everybody need to be ooh, scared of Courtney Cur please Courtney ain't even addressed that she Courtney said I just feel like Marcel be having too much to say especially when it comes to women I think if he just mind his business and his words we'll be good so as Courtney and Stormy are getting up to leave Marceau says, all right, Mr. and Mrs. Steele, y'all have a good day. Stormy got in her husband's ear and said, he said that shit all the time. So now Courtney got to say something because his wife done got in his ear, literally. So he said, you do know 
she's still and I'm Beasley. You you know that, right? Marcel said, no, I didn't know that. You the damn lie. So let me say, well, he's good with it either way because you trying to make a problem. Girl, I know you ain't upset about name calling. Well, Stormy and Courtney are leaving. Kimmy is talking about how much of a failure the Sam meeting was. And Marcel said, I don't think so. I had a good time trading insult shit. So we move on from this meeting and we go to Kimmy's office where she is going to be visited by Nail. Now, now let me let me just be real transparent with y'all. I done watched this scene. Went and took my food off the stove, ate me something, laid down, took a nap some damn well, watched this scene two more times and still don't know what the hell I watched. I don't know what the point or purpose of this meeting was. I'm gonna just tell y'all what the hell happened because I, 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 I. Kimmy is saying in the confessional that the whole reason for this meeting is that Huntsville is small and she doesn't want it to get back to nail that they had this meeting and she wasn't invited and she feels a way because she knows she already feels a way about not being included in the expo. So Miss Nail comes in, now she is serving body, face, confused about why I'm here and he, what the hell is going on with. Now, let me tell y'all something, I love Miss Nail down. I think she's absolutely beautiful. She facially literally reminds me of my grandmother. I think she's an absolutely beautiful woman. But that wig there, that wig there, is a hell no. I don't have a clue how old Nail is. I hope I'm as fine as her when I get to be whatever age she is. But no ma'am, not that wig. I, I love you too much to not tell you no better. Now she comes in, she sits down and Kimmy is asking her how she's doing and it's clear that these two do not know each other well. The energy between them is awkward. So they start out making some small talk. Kimmy is telling her, yeah, I haven't seen you since Baby Ace's reveal. And Nail say, yeah, I just been, you know, working. So Kimmy is asking Nail, do you think we got everything squared away with everybody? Nail look as confused as me. She just, um, Kimmy said, well, mainly with Tisha. Well, well, why? If she got an issue with Tisha, is there not a conversation with Tisha? Because Tisha is a grown, able-bodied, in her right mind adult. Nell said, well, I mean, I think we're okay, but I'm not for sure. Kimmy said, well, I wanted to make sure that you and I were okay. Nell said, okay. Kimmy starts with some roundabout explanation about, well, the reason I invited you here today is because, you know, Huntsville is but so big. And the last time that I saw you at Baby Ace's Reveal, we were talking about the idea of having some sort of a town hall meeting for everybody to give their feedback on the expo. Well, that meeting has happened. Kimmy said, now I know y'all felt a way about not getting invited to the expo in general, but I didn't think this meeting would hold value because I wanted to get feedback from people who were actually there, who actually attended the expo. Kimmy said, my goal wasn't to have people just come and complain about what they felt didn't go right with the first expo. Now, I I'm trying to figure out what is this event session because why are you telling her this? You didn't invite her, okay, and. Nell said, and I wouldn't have complained. I would have come and I would have actually listened. I wouldn't have been coming to rehash anything. My point to Tisha and Marcel from the beginning was that we've been in North Huntsville longer than any of y'all. Kimmy said, and what's that supposed to mean? Nell said, it means I think we should have been there. And then she said, I don't think you should have made that call for me. Kimmy said, what call? Not inviting you to the meeting? She said, yeah. She said, well, it was my meeting. Okay, girl. Nell said, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Because the meeting you held, you originally invited me to, then you turn around and said, you don't see how I would add value to the meeting. So why invite me in the first place? So what I'm trying to understand, I'm trying to catch what she's saying. Did she get invited to the meeting at Asa's baby reveal? And then Kimmy scheduled the meeting and never told her about it. Is that what happened? Kimmy said, well, it was the fact that you and Tisha took exception to the first invitation. In my mind, I thought, well, let me make sure to invite her because obviously if we don't, she's going to feel away and feel left out. So I extended the invitation. But the more I thought about it to myself, the more I resolved that I only really wanted people there who could get feedback about the actual event. Basically, I said to your face, whatever I thought would make you feel good and get me through the moment, but I did something different.
Now, so while I can respect that, I don't agree with it and I don't have to agree with it, but we can agree to disagree and I can respect that. I mean, it was your event and you didn't invite me, so why are we here? Now, so you didn't invite me, there's nothing I can do about that. You invited me here today and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. And the confessional nail says she does feel like her word adds value to the expo. She said she feels like the core six needs to start talking to entrepreneurs outside of themselves, especially ones who have experience like she and her husband who have over 30 years of experience in their fields. And she is right, because that damn core six don't get nothing done but they hair and surgery. I don't understand. They have a whole bunch of meetings where they don't do nothing but yell back and forth at each other about who has done what, who can do what, who ain't gonna do what. But that's exactly why. If I were nail, I wouldn't give a damn. Don't invite me to nothing y'all do because it's all a mess. Kimmy said, well, I am glad that you stopped by today, even if it was just to agree to disagree. You know, I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, we will be doing other things in the future that we will want y'all involved in, so there's no bad blood. Kimmy said, I don't want there to be any bad blood. Nell said, and neither do I. Kimmy said, well, you know I'm mad at you. Kimmy said, well, you know you came in sweet. I don't know anybody that has anything bad to say about you. Nell said, I am sweet. I'm a really sweet person, but I think we all... Kimmy said, got a little nice nasty when it's time. Yeah, Kimmy, I think you got a little more than others, but you know. Now said, well, we're going to move forward. We're good. She said, what they say? We Gucci. Kimmy said, no, nah, that's stormy. I can't afford to be handing out purses to make sure we good. I said, now nah, she buying friends. So we move on to the final scene of the show, which is Martel going to meet Fred on a work site. They're clearing a lot to build a home. Martel said he and Fred have gone into business together. Fred is a general contractor and home builder. And this is the first house that Martel has participated in building in some years. So he's really excited. Martel said in the confessional that he stopped building homes because he was forced to by having to file bankruptcy as a result of going through this divorce. He said he's in a better space. His credit is in a better space. So he's getting back to real estate. But I thought the issue was he didn't have a builder's license. So did he go get a builder's license or is he operating under Fred's license and using his credit? Like what's going on? Well, Fred is telling Martel he's so proud of him. And you know, you walk through this project by yourself. Martel, yeah, just let me do my thing. What, what, what is your thing? That's what we're trying to understand. So as they're talking, Chris Fletcher pulls up. He walks up and they're talking and laughing. Martel looks over at Chris and said, don't come out here showing your sack and them tight ass pants. I said, I know your men in tight ass is a not talking. Martel is standing here in a t-shirt that snatched up on his damn shoulders because it's a damn 2T. And you talking about this damn man and, and the pants he got on? Chris said, well, I get it from you. He said, well, what y'all got going on over here? Y'all building that? He said, what's y'all's timeline on this? Martel said, well, the plan is to have it finished in September and sold in September. Chris says, so I'll be listing it in September. Martel said, well, I might keep it as a rental property. I don't know. Oh, you big mad with Chris. You ain't putting no money in his damn pocket. Chris said, well, speaking of rental properties, uh, when are you moving out? Martel said, well, I guess in about a week and a half or so. Chris said, oh, hell no. That, that's, that's not going to work for me, you, or nobody else. You said two weeks, two weeks ago, and two weeks is up tomorrow. Martel said, that been two weeks already. I thought that was just last week we had that conversation. Chris said, look here, I done told you that the owner is pissed. Martel said, yeah, I know. And this is what this man gets for helping a friend. Chris said, the owner already said, you got to be gone by the first. He said, yeah, I know. And that's my goal I'm about the next week and a half. Fred said, the first? He said, now, Chris, I like you, but I'm trying to figure out what you're throwing. I'm going to need you to sit your ass down because you don't know what's going on. This man is squatting in these people's house. And I know you a friend to everybody or a mediator or whatever you're supposed to be trying to help this man get his life together. But he is actively tearing the shit down while you're trying to help him build it up. First, I mean, you just going to tell the man he got to go like that, Chris said. Uh, yeah, because I have a fiduciary duty to my client. And while he's my friend, that's my client. Fred start looking around like, yeah, money does talk and bullshit walks. And speaking of bullshit walking, uh, have you been looking for something? Martel said, yeah, I already got something. Fred said, okay, good. You ain't got to come to my damn house. Shit. Chris said, great. You found a place. You don't think you can get in there by this weekend? Martel said, no. He said, well, you got to do something. Chris said in the confessional that Martel really needs to get a hold of himself and man the hell up. He said, I need him to do the right thing and do it now. You need to get the hell out this house so I can sell it. Martel's response to Chris is, well, get the trucks over there and come help me then. That's your problem. Don't nobody owe you nothing. You are a grown man. Why do you feel so entitled 
that you think you can tell your friend who you have already crossed a bunch of boundaries with that, yeah, if you want me to get up out this house, you come help me. Martel changed the subject. He ain't got no damn plans getting out this house. So let's just talk for something different. He said, so uh, did you ever talk to Marceau? Chris looked immediately frustrated. He said, yeah, I talked to Marceau. You know, Marceau got that damn, and they said at the same time, that mouthpiece on him. Chris said, how are you going to put on this whole Black Business Expo that's supposed to help the North Side or the community, and it's supposed to be about Black businesses, but you claim to not have known that my wife has had a daycare here for 30 years? Fred said, well, in all fairness, I didn't know you had a daycare either. Chris said, well, in all fairness, you might have seen me in the street, but player, you don't know me. Chris said, the difference is Marceau actually knows me a little better than you. I don't mean no harm, but I, I don't know you and you don't know me. So I don't expect you to know that my wife has a daycare that she's had for three decades. But Marceau, yeah. He said, and even if you want to play the, oh, he just didn't know card, I'm a real estate broker. And I know he knows that. He not lie and use the man name for that. So you can't say that you don't know that we are contributing members of this community. I said, well, you know, now that you break it all down like that, it would have been nice for us to be involved in that shit. We making a difference in the community. We've been doing it. Chris said, well, speaking of making a difference, uh, they also said they were able to get some sponsorships that might have helped make a difference in what that damn event cost them. You know the first thing, Martel? Want to know they ain't say how much it was? Chris said, no, Tisha ain't want to reveal all that. Martel said, see, and that was Melody's suggestion. They went and got sponsorships after she said, you can go and do that. Yeah, they were sitting around like, yeah. We didn't think of doing that. Yeah, it was a lot of shit y'all didn't think about doing till the hopes put y'all on. I said, well, just okay. Chris kept stirring the damn pot. Chris said, well, I think he was saying that he would only pay people to speak who he deemed professionals. Fred said, well, excuse me. Uh, I don't mean to keep interrupting y'all conversation, but uh, I was at the BBC last year and uh, Mel was a speaker there and she did a really good job. Martel said, yeah, she always does a good job because she's a damn good speaker. She's one of the better speakers he can get. As a matter of fact, she was speaking back when you was working at the movie theater with the big ass suits on. I said, no, Steve Harvey. Martel said she should be paid to speak. Respect all that. He said, I just can't stand when people use you and then don't want to acknowledge the fact that they used you. Chris just messy as hell. Chris ain't done yet. He is fully entertained by this shit. He said, well, you know, even with Sculpt, you know he made the comment, where's Sculpt now? Martel said, slap, like, bullshit. This, listen, Chris turned his head. Like, it took everything in him not to bust out laughing. Martel said, what I told him is, we're gonna start Sculpt, we're gonna bring you in. Sculpt is gonna do the same thing that Holt and Holt does. You're gonna buy me out, and that's exactly what happened. So there would be no Sculpt without me or Melody. So for the duration of our lives, put some respect on it. I said, all right, Birdman, is you finished or is you done? He said, everything you got now, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have touched anything if we hadn't been friends to your family. Martel said in the confessional, I just saw Marceau at that town hall meeting, and if I knew he had been talking reckless like this, I'd have confronted him then. He said, I don't understand why. He would be out there talking about me or Melody this way when he knows we made him. I see talking that Godfather shit now. He said, and that's why I don't like fake people. And little does he know, it can all be taken away from you in many a ways. Because God don't play and neither do I. Well, you better testify. And it looks like next week they're going to resume right in the middle of this conversation. Where Martel is going to be going off and Chris is still going to be instigating trying to get this man to go fight. Kimmy is still going to be working on her kegel muscles and not her damn marriage. Marceau is going to be venting to his wife that he is bothered by Stormy calling him all kind of pictures and hoes. And Tisha's going to be defending Stormy about, well, I like Stormy. M more than your damn husband. Martel is going to finally confront Marceau. He's going to be telling him, going to be trying to downplay what me and Melody have done for y'all. Marceau said, well, who's done the most? Martel said, who's done the most? What do you mean? Because you ain't done sh for me. And once again, for some reason or another, Mel is meeting with another member of Tisha's family. And she's going to be talking to Kiki about, are you and Tisha doing better? And for some reason, Kiki is going to choose to spill all the tea about who she thinks Marcel had an affair with. Child, it's the time. But that's it. That's all. And I ain't got no more. Thank you so much for coming down here, listening to me and letting me get this off my chest. Please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. And in the meantime, until next time, just like every time, I love you and I mean it. Bye.